Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. Feel free to uh, introduce yourself, say where you're from over in the in the chat on the right side of your screen. But it is one o'clock Eastern time and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks to, uh, to everyone for joining us. Uh, so uh, well, you're welcome to today's webinar, which is entitled Holiday Hearts and Heartbreaks. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by EB Medicine. EB Medicine helps urgent care clinicians get up to speed quickly and stay current on the latest evidence so that you can feel confident treating patients in the urgent care setting. Plus, EB Medicine makes earning CME credit easy and affordable. My name is Dr. Patrick O'Malley. I'm the course director for the laceration course here at EB Medicine, and I'll be the moderator for today's event. After the presentation, you'll get to see a brief demo of EB Medicine's resource that's made ideally for PAs and nurse practitioners practicing in urgent care, and it's called the Urgent Care EKG course. And I can tell you that as an emergency physician, I have really gotten a lot of great tips and knowledge that have changed my practice. It really is a fantastic course. And if you stay until the end, you'll get a special bonus when subscribing. Uh, this uh, presentation is going to be recorded and it will be available to everybody who has registered, usually within about a week or so. So now let's get into today's session. But first, I'd like to introduce everyone here to Jen, Jennifer or Jen Carlquist, PAC. Jen has practiced cardiology and emergency medicine for the last 16 years. She began her career as a paramedic and then developed a passion for cardiology early in her career. Jen has developed and delivered many education programs on cardiology related topics, including high risk presentations and how to identify subtle ischemia on EKGs. She's recognized as a leading expert in EKG interpretation. Furthermore, she's just an amazing person and I'm honored to call her a friend. Uh, her passion for this stuff is, is really truly palpable and she's dedicated her life to educating others and giving them confidence with EKG interpretation. In today's webinar, as we count down to the winter holidays, you know, it's uh, tis the season for cardiac events. Research shows that people die from heart attacks between Thanksgiving and New Year's Day more than at any other time of the year. And it's a perfect recipe for disaster. We have overindulgence on food, alcohol, holiday stress, and the joys of being with family. Uh, they call it the holiday heart for a reason. Jen will prepare you for the high-risk weeks ahead. She's made a list of cardiac arrhythmias and warning signs, and she has checked it twice. In this timely webinar, you're going to find out which EKG patterns are naughty or nice. Uh, so this presentation is about 40 minutes, and then we'll have a live question and answer session followed by a demo of the Urgent Care EKG course from EB Medicine. Enjoy, ask questions, and take it away, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Patrick, for uh, such a peppy a little intro there, quirky and witty as usual. I love your Santa hat, by the way. And yes, as Patrick has already alluded to, the upcoming period that we are about to delve into is the most high risk period of the year. But we're going to go in ready and armed, and I'm going to give you some tips on things to look for and also some things that should worry you. We will do some cases as well and make it a little more authentic with some things that we might see coming around the holidays. Now, what's interesting is that, and you have probably all seen this as well, is that people, for some reason, do not want to go to the emergency room, right? And so there's lots of reasons for this. There was an article in Time Magazine back in 2018 where they proved that visits to urgent care went up 119% citing cost and wait times as a big factor. Now, I know this to be true because A, I worked urgent care during this period and oftentimes we were just bombarded. And I know that there's a lot of pressure in deciding who needs to be triaged to the ER and who we can actually keep in the urgent care and maybe get them home with a safe disposition. So really the question in, in everyone's mind is how much do I worry about this EKG? That's the question we're going to try to answer today. And I want to hear from you, though, real quick in the chat. I can see it now. Um, can you try? Oh, hey, Julie, what's up? Hey, Stephanie, can you tell me, has this been true for you, too? Have you been seeing volume increase? Have you been hearing patients say they don't want to go to the ER? Can't you just do something here? And let me know in the chat if that's been true for you. 
and I'll, I'll circle back to the chat. So really this period of time, as Patrick alluded to, is there's lots of gifts and some of them are all the gifts you didn't want, like lots more patients, uh, patients who are frustrated, patients who may be rushing you to get home back to their family, or patients that may even just delay coming in at all and may come in thicker. So the acuity that we're going to see during this period of time is worse too, because people also tend to throw caution out the window when gravy is involved, right? So as, as Patrick already said, and thank you for setting me so, up so beautifully for that, is that this is, there's an article here that, that shows that yes, between Christmas and New Year's is really the riskiest time of the year. And, you know, the emotional stresses of the holidays, even if it's a good stress. So yes, you're looking forward to seeing all your family, but you are worried, you know, will they like the food? Will they like the presents? Is Aunt Jana going to argue with Uncle Joe again? And is there going to be a fight? And I will tell you that as a side note here, we often will write off emotional induced chest pain as you're just anxious, but sometimes this can actually be an anginal equivalent. So we in cardiology a lot of times think, oh, um, cardiac, cardiac, you know, equivalent. Emo, you know, anything where you're exerting yourself and it creates pain, this is the same thing. We also tend to want to self-medicate with alcohol. So there's more alcohol flowing. And, and if people aren't self-medicating, they're celebrating, but either way, the alcohol is flowing. And unfortunately, that can lead to one arrhythmia we'll talk about a lot. And then if you think about the COVID pandemic right now, right, there's tons of COVID going around, plus little ventilation. People are condensed because the Windows are closed, it's hot outside. And of course, people don't wanna go to the ER because they don't wanna miss out on anything that's happening, right? And if they are coming in to see us, wherever they are, they're like, chop, chop, let's go, let's do this. And that puts undue stress on the provider, you, to make quick decisions and maybe not the safest ones. So my little bit of caution for you is to, when people are rushing you, just know that it just expect it already, right? And anchor yourself strongly into, I'm gonna do the right thing, no matter what the time constraints are, I'm gonna do the right thing for the patient. Because ultimately I want them to have a good outcome and I don't wanna lose my license, right? That's that's a big deal. So we're gonna cover some of these chief complaints, right? Things that are high risk, and I'm just gonna check the chat real quick. High emotions over football, exactly. And that's so true, good point, Suzanne. We're going to talk about shortness of breath and palpitations and syncope. And my nugget for you on this is that really I want you to have permission to have a low threshold to get an EKG and see what you're dealing with. There was a case of a female that came, this was pre-COVID, to urgent care with a cough. She's 36, school teacher. I've got a cough for a week. It's a Friday. I got to get better for this wedding. I want that medication that starts with a Z. You guys all know what I mean. It's a Z pack. And what's interesting is that we're not seeing anymore, right? We're not seeing people asking for Z packs anymore since COVID. COVID was a game changer. You're no longer having the virus versus bacteria discussion anymore. It's like, I may have a COVID test. Oh, I don't have COVID. Awesome. I'm going to go home and be thankful, right? They don't need the bonus prize of the Z pack that they didn't need anymore. But at the end of the day, this lady came in wanting a Z-Pack to get better for the wedding, but she ended up on x-ray that they did at urgent care having a pneumonia. I put it in quotes because it wasn't a pneumonia, but they appropriately referred her to the ED for pneumonia. And, you know, she was a little tacky. So, of course, in that scenario, we're also going to start thinking about pulmonary embolus because tachycardia, right? We always want to think about P first, especially if there's risk factors. But she's got this pneumonia, so, you know, maybe she's dehydrated. Maybe she just didn't feel well. Maybe she took a cough suppressant that has a little bit of stimulant in it. Any of these things could make her heart rate elevated. So they did a work upon her, and her EKG was abnormal. All she had was nonspecific ST T-wave changes. She, the 38-year-old, did not have pneumonia. She had a pleural effusion from CHF that was new from triple vessel disease at 36 and ended up getting a cabbage. So 
again, if we anchor ourselves in the fact that yes, winter time, pneumonia, 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 COVID, right? It can be other things. So we have to get these EKGs. And the winner of that whole story was actually the, the triage nurse at the hospital. Because I asked the provider later, would you have gotten an EKG on this patient? And honestly, it would have been defensible if he didn't. He had a, a read of an pneumonia, right? And she's 36 with no history, really. Well, it turned out she did have history. She had familial hyperlipidemia, and she had um, elevated glucose. It was 310 on the first check, so obviously diabetes. And those two things made her heart age a lot actually older than it was. So we have this tendency to look at people for their chronological age, but we really need to look at it based on their heart age. And that's factoring risk factors, heart scores, all the other things, comorbidities. So let's talk about some killer causes, things that can be dangerous, and let's bring them to the first and for forefront. And so we can talk about them and make sure we don't miss them. So this is actually a list of things when you have a chest pain patient that you should consider in your differentials. Now, what I recommend, especially to newer providers when they're learning this, is to really broaden your differential net. Make it as wide as you can and make sure you consider as many things as possible. And before you do that though, or as you're doing it, making sure that you're thinking worst first so you don't get burned. Worst first would be obviously ACS. Pneumothorax would be awful. AAA would be awful. And so thinking about all these things is critical so that you don't miss them, but you can't catch them if you don't think about them. So make a long list, see which ones can kill somebody right now if you miss it, and then go from there. So this would be an example of a pneumothorax over here. This is um, an example of a pneumonia. And this is somebody having ACS over here. And of course, there's other things on this list that are that are pretty bad. You know, CHF, for example, pericarditis, but pericarditis isn't going to kill you. The one thing I'll caution you, know, though, with pericarditis is a lot of times it comes with a pericardial effusion as well. And so you will a lot of times see that. And the killer there would be if it's big, or large, and if it's sudden and large, that can lead to something called cardiac tamponade, and that can be lethal. So in a nutshell, pericarditis isn't gonna kill you, but you gotta worry about the things that come with the pericarditis. You gotta worry about also ACS, but the things that come with ACS, like left ventricular aneurysm. So there's all sorts of things to add to this list. Now, if you had somebody who like literally came in, would there, was there something that they could say to you that would stop you in the tracks, that would be, you'd be like, yeah, you are going to the emergency department. There's no thought in my mind. I'm not gonna do anything else. You're just going. What would that one line be in your mind? What could they say? I'm checking the chat here. Same pain I had with my last heart attack. Oh, I totally agree, Patrick, for sure. Um, but I'm looking for one other thing that that I think is like a absolutely like high blood pressure and the pain radiates to my back. That that's like, yeah, I'm you're gonna go because I'm concerned about. Does anybody know what I'm thinking about? Chest pain that radiates to the back with a very high blood pressure. I feel like I'm gonna die. Wesley, that is spot on. And I will tell you this as a paramedic, previous paramedic, Wesley, that. The patients who said that on the ambulance, they either were near death and some of them actually died when they said that. So as long as the patient isn't in there, you know, texting on their phone and trying to get seen quicker, hey, I feel like I'm going to die, right? Then it is true. But that's a good one. And, and so I'm thinking about triple A, a rupture triple A. If somebody says pain ratings to the back, I'm always like on high alert with that. So let's talk about some other things. So what would you think if somebody had one leg swollen only and they had pain in their leg? That's a high risk thing. What would you say? Type that in the chat. Swollen in one leg. And then can't lie flat. That's another thing that should make us concerned. That tells us that patients most likely have what? And I, I'm hoping that someone will chat and give us some ideas. If not, I can just tell you. And then uh, pain that is localized, especially after getting off an airplane, 
especially if a patient's a smoker, right? What do we think about there? So I'll just go through these with you. If you can't lie flat, we worry about pericarditis, okay? And that is going to come with a widespread ST elevation on the EKG with no reciprocal changes. Now, substernal chest pain, especially if it's emotion driven or if it is exertion driven, we worry about MI. Pain that is localized, we worry about pulmonary embolus. And one leg that is swollen, we worry about deep vein thrombosis. So we always are just pondering the differentials, checking our list twice and making sure we don't miss anything. So here's a couple things talking about the chief complaints that I keep in my differential bag, so to speak. Now, the things that are pink are heart, the things that are black are lung, and then there's, of course, this, this red herring that's red anemia because blood is red. So when you're looking at someone, you're considering all of these, so you're going to do an EKG. You also, at most urgent cares, have access to chest x-ray, so you can quickly snap an x-ray, snap an EKG, and sometimes you have point of care blood labs, which would be great, and you could look for anemia. I threw this on here. I know today is supposed to be mostly EKGs, but this is something that we forget about, and I also threw it on here because Anemia can also lead to high output failure, heart failure. So if somebody's super anemic, their heart's working really hard, they can also have heart failure. So we don't like to leave really profound anemia unchecked. And so we can do other things. Look at them. We can look at their conjunctiva, right? We can, you know, look at their overall skin tone. And then you'll see all of these on the EKG. Although you may not see CHF on the EKG. You may see some left ventricular hypertrophy for CHF, but not always, in, you know, especially if there isn't a thickened heart or a cardiomyopathy. Now, pulmonary embolus, you can see, you'll see an S1, Q3, T3. Pneumonia is pretty clear cut. COVID, you can do a quick swab. Asthma and allergies, that's more of a clinical diagnosis. So chest pain, um, the, big, the big things we really want to put forefront is this triple A. I keep bringing this back because we have to have this on our radar. There's also um, something called SCAD, sudden coronary artery dissection that is more common in females, females that are pregnant with connective tissue disorders where the coronary artery just ruptures. There's also something called a myocardial bridge where um, the heart actually, the LAD actually goes underneath a little patch of muscle on the heart and comes out the other side. There's also vasospasm. So there's all sorts of things that are on this list that can cause chest pain. And this is just a little widening or deepening of what you add as your differentials when you look at a patient. I have to tell you that a lot of times we will get an EKG in this situation. And if it's normal, there is a sort of false sense of security because the machine said it's normal. I'm going to tell you that if you have an EKG, where the machine says it's normal. That is number one, only right six to 42% of the time. But also it's unfortunate, but I've had people with triple vessel disease have a normal EKG because of balanced ischemia. So just know that a normal ECG does not close the book. If they have concerning symptoms, you're gonna go ahead and keep going in your workup. So syncope, we're going to think about all of these things, specifically prolonged QT. Does anybody know at what number the QT, usually we start seeing um, some um, torsades? Torsades. Um, well, hey, Natalie from New Jersey. And Alana PE, absolutely. Patrick Pneumothorax, absolutely. So what's the number that you see? The number is usually over 500 milliseconds. That's where everybody starts getting interested. I will tell you that this that can lead to torsades. You can see it under 500, of course. And then these two things are congenital. You want to memorize these patterns. If you don't know these, please learn them. They, especially if you're doing sports physicals or seeing young people, if a young person has syncope, the money question to ask them is, has anybody in your family ever died? of a young sudden cardiac arrest for any reason uh, atraumatic, like they didn't get hit by a bus or a truck or fall out of a plane. And then you're, you're thinking about, you know, hypotension because a lot of times 
we end up over medicating our patients and it just is that easy. We don't want to start out with that, right? Because we want to think we're source, but sometimes it is just that easy. So here's kind of a list that I keep. And, you know, Hokum and Borgata, the two high risk um, congenital things, I'm always looking for those on my radar, right? I'm always looking for pauses or, or too slow bradycardia. I'm looking at the PR because if it's short, I'm thinking about, well, Parkinson's white. That comes with a delta wave, which is a slurred upstroke of the QRS. I'm also looking at the voltage because if they have low voltage, then that's concerning for um, pericardial effusion, which is not benign, okay? It can definitely cause symptoms and it's often overlooked multiple times. So think about this if they have syncope or dyspnea, if it's very fast or if they have a prolonged QT because you worry about torsades. So um, palpitations is something I absolutely love, 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 love. My favorite complaint. And, you know, the workup for this is going to look, you know, pretty similar to a syncope workup, but you want to make sure, and I'm going to hammer this home, get a TSH, please. <laughs> get a TSH if you can, if you're able to run labs where you are. If you're if you're not, right, um, in, you know, if you're in the ED and you're watching this, please get a TSH because the common thing that happens is We'll see someone in cardiology and follow up, and unfortunately, there has been no TSH done, and they had palpitations. But we need to rule out the fact that the thyroid isn't causing problems. We also need to look at their meds. We need to think about low magnesium, all these things with palpitations. We also need to think about what kind of arrhythmias could we be encountering. So that's something that you want to look at their age, because if somebody is, you know, late 50s, 60s, 70s, and they have palpitations, I'm probably going to see. AFib with RVR, but if someone's, you know, 18, 19, 20, 30, I'm probably going to see, honestly, nothing because it's anxiety, but I'm never going to go there first. Could be some PACs, could be some PVCs, could be SVT, but it's probably not going to be AFib, although there are outliers, right? So thinking about the pretest probability. Now let's do some cases and jump in and see what we think. Let me actually go forward here. So none of these patients are real faces, of course. This is a um, gentleman with some chest pain. He says, I'm fine. I will just take some more nitro. It is my fifth one today. So a couple things on that. If somebody says it's my fifth nitro today, either their nitro is bad or it's, you know, expired or potentially it is um, not cardiac, like maybe it's a GERD situation, or it could be the big one, so to speak, right? So that's always like warning, 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 red flag. Um, his blood pressure's, you know, not too low despite taking two nitro, which I'm surprised, means he probably is high, really hypertensive normally. Heart rate's 80, his temp is not elevated. So uh, his EKG is here. I'm going to tell you guys that this EKG um says something that I think should keep everybody up at night, honestly. And it used to keep me up at night until I mastered a way around it. So ST, T wave abnormality, okay? That is probably the most scary thing that you will ever see on the EKG. I know you're thinking, no, 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 no. If I see VTAC or asystole, that's scary. No, actually, this should be the thing that should scare you because this is gonna lull you into being like, well, it's not a STEMI and you know, the patient looks good, so I'm just going to refer to cardiology. That is the thing that will make you lose your license the fastest, okay? Because there's at least five things in here that will, in when it says that, that can be, you need to either go to the ER right now or right now, right? <laughs> like, it's, it's serious. So when the machine says lateral ischemia, it's talking about the lateral leads over here, V5 and V6. It's saying that because there's some inverted symmetric T waves. So with that being said, that is number one going to be ischemia until proven otherwise. They are inverted over here in V5 and V6 where they shouldn't be, but probably more concerning is the T wave in V4. It is biphasic. It goes up and down in the same lead and that in and of itself should be a, don't pass go, don't collect 200. You're going to the ED right now, no matter what, because it, this T wave is always ischemia until proven otherwise, okay, always. 
And then lastly on this, there's a little bit of low voltage here in ADL, which would correspond to the lateral leads because these are connected via the circumflex. They, they are actually fed. And then the last thing on here that's concerning is that this guy has some pretty big T waves here. And this is what happens pre-STEMI. So this patient did STEMI five minutes after the CKG was taken. So obviously this is a big deal. These are findings that you want to take your time and invest spending the time learning and you that you feel like super solid and comfortable with them. Okay, so um, this lady, she, how much does this make you worry? She says, I, I am here with some, you know, I don't know, epigastric discomfort. I ate a lot of turkey. Um, the pain goes to my back, but I think I'm just too full. I think I'm just too full. So what do you guys think about that? She's, she's turning into a, I would say, turning into a car salesman uh, or a woman. She's, she's trying to convince us that it's just that she ate too much. But if, if it's that, really, are you going to come to the urgent care for I just ate too much? No, you're not. And also, if somebody tries to sell you on the fact that it's just, 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 whatever it is, it's probably not just, just, just that thing. <laughs> okay, so be really wary when somebody says that. So this young lady, she's got a blood pressure that's markedly elevated. Her heart rate is tachycardic. So her, I'm absolutely going to worry about a triple A with her. Um, but also, um, her EKG is is fairly alarming. And her EKG, you can see she has that same thing where she has inverted symmetric in B5 and B6. Also, she has it in B4. And the T waves in 1 and ABL also, which are connected to the circ, are inverted and they shouldn't be. And notice the T waves in AVR, B1, they are upright. They shouldn't be. They are supposed to be inverted. That is also a clue. So any T wave that is behaving badly is a problem. And lastly, lastly, you can also see the T wave that's inverted over here. The T wave is inverted here. But this guy in V3, he is biphasic. And that, like I said, is a don't stop go, don't collect 200. So she is also going to go to the ED. And hopefully uh, Patrick will be on so he can take care of her. Now, this guy, uh, he had some beers. And you know if a patient says they had two beers, it's probably multiplied by two at least. Because patients are modest about what they've had to drink. But we know we're just going to add a couple on because, you know, let's just be realistic. And he had his holiday party last night. So he's probably in his 40s to 50s. So, of course... I'm going to worry about holiday heart, and we're probably going to see something like this, okay? So something like this would be bad, and this patient has a scary wide rhythm. Now, I'm going to tell you, I know that it's a real thing that when you had to take ACLS, that we beat it into you, that if you saw wide and fast, we were like, you must Go with VTAC. I mean, it, it almost creates some PTSD, a knee-jerk reaction when you see this, you know, fast, wide. And that's because it mostly honestly is. But this one is, it is actually irregular, and that rules it out. And you know then that it is actually not VTAC. But this is irregularly regular. With a wide QRS complex, this is none other than AFib with rapid ventricular response. But there's something additional to it. And the patient actually has a delta wave underlying. And the delta wave makes the QRS wide. So even if this is scary, right? And I'm going to tell you what is scary. Scary is the phone call that, as urgent care, you're making to the ED. And I can say that working in the ED, I know that we don't answer the phone in the most, like, welcoming manner. Right? So here's what I'm going to recommend. Let's just say you didn't know what this is. Okay, but you identified you have a sick patient, they need to go, and you, do, you just don't know. You could describe it. So how would that look? You could say, hey, um, emergency department, I'm sending a 42-year-old male. He's currently has stable vital signs, but his heart rate's 211, and he has a wide, irregular um, tachycardia. I'm sending him your way. He's five minutes out. Because in the ER, what we're doing is we're planning, like, do I need to move my guy out of room 20 for your guy? Because I don't have enough rooms, right? Your guy sounds pretty urgent. 
I don't know what it is, but I can at least, okay, heart rate 211 wide complex, I know I'm gonna have to do something. So just know that you can always fall back on that if you don't know the answer. Okay, now this is a female, she is older, she says she is tired. I will tell you that tired older females make me nervous because the differentials are so wide and honestly, every female is tired all the time. We just are. Um, I always do this little example when I'm live and I'll say, hey, females, who's not tired? Raise your hand. I'm like, maybe one female raises her hand. We all go over to her afterwards and ask her, what's your secret? But the, the moral of the story is if some female tells you, oh, I'm here for fatigue or I'm tired, you have to push harder and say, well, how is this different than your normal tired? How is it different? Tell me what's, okay, well, oh, you can only walk one block where you could walk five blocks last week. Okay, thank you for quantifying that. Like you need to really know. And she says, but I think it's just that I was, you know, rushing around wrapping the gifts and shopping and, and, you know, that's stressful in and of itself, but her heart rate, you know, it's okay, not bradycardic. Her blood pressure is a little low, 100 over uh, 50. So, um, you know, she could be over medicated and it could just be her blood pressure, but wait, no, it's not. Okay. <laughs> it's not just tired. It almost never is that someone's just tired. Keep pushing is the moral of the story. And you can see that she's got some inverted symmetric T waves that are like diving boards in V2 and V3, also V4, V5, and V6. This patient has ACS until proven. Otherwise, you are not keeping this patient in the urgent care. So right now, uh, you're like, the ER is like, man, that urgent care is calling a lot. <laughs> but we just have a lot of sick people today. So this is another one. How much does it make you worry? I was shoveling the snow and now my chest hurts. So blood pressure's high, heart rate's a little high. How worried are we about this patient? Well, this is his initial EKG. And um, yeah, definitely if you have any questions, please post them, I'd love to interact with you guys. So this EKG, I'm gonna tell you, um, led to, well, let me back up. Initially, we look at this EKG, we're like normal ECG, um, he's 67, he's got chest pain. It was exertional and therefore I am worried more than I would be, right? Okay, could he have like not shoveled snow and, you know, pull the chest muscle potentially? Sure, but that's a diagnosis of exclusion. It is not that into an EKG and it's not something else. So his EKG says normal. So should we just believe it? Should we just go on and be like, okay, machine, cool. Sir, you're actually fine. You can go home. Wrong answer, right? <laughs> That's how you get in trouble because here's the thing. Knowing the direction of your T waves is so incredibly important. If you look at AVL, you know AVL's T wave should be upright. You know that V1's T wave should be inverted and it's so they're not. These are small clues. And then some people say on the CKG, well, I see a little ST elevation in V2 and V3. That's true. There is a little it's not yet enough to be significant. He, at 60 years old, must meet two small boxes in V2 and V3 to meet criteria for STEMI identification. Machine knows this, it's already been programmed, that's why it's not calling it a STEMI. But guess what? Four minutes after the CKG was taken, this patient developed an anterior wall STEMI, he actually met the criteria of ST elevation, and he ended up developing, fully completing within his EKG set on the way to the hospital, completing a right bundle branch block. And I know that you're taught, oh, new left bundle, new left bundle all day long, right? Oh, no, left, 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 left. Nobody talks about the right, but the right bundle, if it's newly formed, can also happen from an LAD occlusion. So it's the subtle things is the moral of the story that I'm telling you that really, it's, the, you know, if this said STEMI, you'd be like, cool, this is so easy. I'm gonna send the patient to the ED, but if it's this, Little stuff, it's this gray area, like this is the stuff that should make you worry. What were the clues? Well, inverted metric T-wave and AVL, and also this starting to form a bundle, and also a little bit of ST elevation here. And the real take home and what the guidelines are supporting now, as of November 15th, 2022, the consensus pathway says we should be, if there's concern, doing serial EKGs. And so this would not have been caught if they didn't do serial EKGs. We do it all on the ambulance all the time because we have the patient hooked up, but it could be done in urgent care. I know urgent care is swamped, but you can go, you can leave, you can tell your MA or, or nurse in a hurry, we're going to, hey, 
Um, the CKGs love normal. I'm going to leave a machine on them. And I'm going to go see the lack next door and maybe find out what I have to do. And just rerun their EKG for me in five minutes. And just leave them. Because it's worth seeing if they have a dynamic EKG change. It can really change the course of the patient's future. So uh, I'm so stressed out. My heart is racing. I got to clean up the house and everything, get it ready for all my guests. Am I just anxious? Well, your vitals look great. So I don't know. Are you just anxious potentially? No, it's never anxiety <laughs> until proven otherwise, right? It's not. And what's happening here is unfortunately a risk factor for developing atrial fibrillation is stress. It is type A. It is drinking. It is being extreme athlete. It is having untreated sleep apnea. There are a lot of things that can lead to this, but this, this young lady has AFib. Now, I'm going to tell you, in order to make this diagnosis, you want to look at this bottom long lead pulled out for you. And a lot of folks that I, I know do this, right, and I've been guilty of it too, will go into the CKG and your eyes will obsess on, is this a P wave? If you're trying to, like, convince yourself that there's a P, there probably isn't a P. And that's the best advice I can give you. And then also the fact that this is irregularly regular, that's also kind of a um, deal breaker that this is atrial fibrillation. So now we've got to have a conversation with her. How old is she? We have to do a CHADS VASC2 score to see if she's at risk for stroke. And we also need to obviously first, first time out of the gate ER or uh, AFib who's symptomatic, you know, potentially we could refer her to the ER. Um, but it depends on your comfort level. If you can get labs to see what her kidney function is, if you feel comfortable putting someone on anticoagulation. But here's what I want to leave you with for sure on this case is that if you have a new onset AFib in your urgent care and they're not on anticoagulation and you're not comfortable putting them on it for whatever reason, do not let them go unprotected while they wait for cardiology to see them. Because if they have a stroke in between, you are liable and that is not good. Okay, so either, you know, refer to the ED or get comfortable or get some labs. So, um, Patrick, how are we doing on time? I think you're on mute. You're on mute. Confirm. Okay. There you are. All right, can you hear me now? Yeah, are we doing okay? Yeah, yeah, we got another about you know three or four minutes, and then we'll switch over. It doesn't look like there's a whole lot of questions, so go for another five minutes, and then we okay. can perfect answer some questions. Okay, awesome. So this is another uh, gentleman who um, he was watching football with his dad. I think uh, Suzanne had alluded to that earlier. The family rivalry, right, with the teams. We got into a big argument, and my chest hurts. Well, luckily, um, you know, his blood pressure isn't too high. I would expect. If he's drinking this much beer, his blood pressure would be higher. I'm surprised his heart rate isn't higher with all that adrenaline pumping. Um, but actually, wait, that heart rate was wrong. This is a ZKG. Well, actually, it's probably a little bit more than an argument that's going on. There is actually a STEMI brewing. You can see some ST elevation down in three, down in F. It's more than one box, which is all you need. And you need to have two up and two down, right? So Two leads with contiguous elevation and then two leads with reciprocal depression, which are in one in AVL. So this is actually a STEMI. But the reason why you may be faked out by this is because there's also a right bundle making the QRS all weird, making it hard to find the ST segment elevation. And this patient went to cath and actually was in new onset AFib, went to cath, had a complete RCA, 100% occlusion, got stented and did better, but his AFib was driven by his ischemia. That was a really good thing that he went and got checked out and didn't just write it off to an argument. Now, this one is a case that I think we're gonna see a lot of this year. We saw a lot of it with COVID. And this was somebody who lost her husband and she has to spend Thanksgiving alone. It's Thanksgiving, that's, an, that's a hard time. And she says she doesn't have much steam. I'm surprised by how many of our older folks that come in will use this term. I just don't feel like I have much steam or, or some version thereof, right? And my legs are swollen. Well, so of course we're gonna anticipate here that she's got some, well, wait a minute. Oh, that was not what I was expecting to see. Her EKG, you can see in V1, shows AFib. Now, sometimes 
This looks a little bit flutterish at some points. He was going in and out of A fifth and A flutter. And honestly, for our purposes, whatever it is, fl Fibra flutter, she still needs a Chad's Vast 2 score to risk stratify her. And um, she also has some biphasic T in V2 and a symmetric inverted T in V3. And she ended up having this finding and these inverted symmetric T's because she had cardiomyopathy. But what flavor cardiomyopathy? And her history should tell you, the history should tell you. Can I explain more about irregularly irregular? Yes, if it is irregular, but there's no pattern to the irregularity. Like for example, if you have a extra beat like a PAC, it'll come in at a regular fashion, especially if it's bigeminal. But AFib is like no rhyme, no reason, throw some spaghetti at the wall, and it's just chaos, it's utter chaos. And go dogs, absolutely. So the, the kind of the flavor that she had was Takatsubo's, also known as broken heart syndrome. And guys, I gotta tell you, you it's are gonna see a lot of this this week um, and, and, and this month, honestly, because people are heartbroken. And, um, you know, it's not something you're ever gonna diagnose on the EKG. It's gonna be diagnosed in, in the cath lab, honestly, or on an echo potentially. But the history is what drives it. So, Patrick, did you have a comment or a question, or we need to pause? Uh, yeah, I think we can probably go ahead and pause and just you know answer some questions and and throw some things out. And I think you know you and I had talked previously. You know, let's say for for this patient or somebody with congestive heart failure, you know, what happens? You know, when when they get to the emergency department. So, in the urgent care setting, you have this patient. They've got some shortness of breath. They had you know four servings of gravy and and stuffing and you know a huge high sodium load when they um, uh, over, over the holiday. And they get here, they're short of breath. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff can be done in the urgent care setting. You know, you're listening for rouse on auscultation. Uh, their blood pressure may be elevated. Uh, the pharmacy's closed, so they didn't get in to get their blood pressure medication or their Lasix. And they get there and they just kind of sound wet. Um, you know, if you have the ability to give them some Lasix ahead of time, you know, you, ma you make the phone call, they're going to be transferred over to the emergency department. Um, you know, if they're significantly hypertensive, you can give them some nitroglycerin uh, to try to start vasodilation and and help with diuresis by the time they get to the emergency department. But, you know, when they get there to us, you know, the things that, um, you know, if you're able to start an IV, that's also very helpful. EMS can do that if they're sent by EMS. Uh, but we want to really, you know, tackle that patient quickly uh, when they get into the emergency department, check their uh, oxygenation, their ventilation, uh, giving them, you know, a, a couple doses of IV Lasix, nitroglycerin, and, you know, if, they, if they're if they getting worse, then we're going to consider putting them on um, uh, assisted ventilation, either with BiPAP or CPAP, to really try to drive that fluid out and, and get them stabilized. Um, you know, I, I put a question in here with old EKGs. How important are old EKGs? If you have the ability in urgent care to look up old records, how important is that? It is very critical to do that. And one of the biggest reasons is because, well, th think about Q waves is, is kind of what I use that for a lot. If you have a Q wave on an EKG today, I want to know if it's new because everybody teaches you, oh, Q waves mean old MI. But actually, Q waves can form within an hour of the infarction. So you could potentially be dealing with a new ischemic problem. So I want to compare and see if they have old Q waves or not. That's super helpful. And then also you can use it if, you know, anything just looks funny, compare it to the previous EKG. And it, it can be a game changer. I love having access to old records. So I think it's it's important. Yeah, we do that in the emergency department all the time. And sometimes, you know, they're traveling or they've never been to the ER. And sometimes we can just call over to, you know, it, it takes more effort, but it can give you some really good information. You call their primary care doctor's office. Hey, can you fax over an EKG? And then you see that left bundle branch. Oh, that was old. That's been there. Or mm -hmm. Ooh, no, that left bundle branch is not old. That's new. And that really, you know, elevates the game here and uh, will help you with your disposition. So really important to try to find an old EKG if you're able to get one. 
Would you like me to stop my screen so you can share yours? Yeah, the, that's fine. Um, so what we'll do is, you know, just a few more minutes for any questions. Does anybody have any uh, specific questions for Jen? Please put them in the chat. Um, you know, another one that we've got um, is, you know, the the over reliance on the EKG interpretation, the machine interpretation. How how big of a problem is that? Very big, and you know, it's funny because with the big you know, spotlight being on AI right now, you would think that AI would work its way into EKG software interpretation ASAP. That would make patients yeah. safer, that would make everyone's life easier, but it's not there yet. Mm -hmm. And so in the meantime, there's all these high risk conditions that don't get picked up. Vergatas will never say Vergatas. Hokum will never say Hokum. Um, and all these weird like hyper acute T waves and, and new things that are stemi equivalents are not being programmed in. Wellens warning is not programmed in. D Winters is not. So literally, what does it mean when the machine says something? I take it with a grain of salt, but you really have to actually know how to read the EKG. There's just no way around it. You can't like cheat your way out of it. There's just no no cheat code, so to speak. Right. Yeah, and I think that we all get lulled into that that sense of security. All the EKG machine says it's normal, and I think that. Uh, you know, malpractice attorneys have a plethora of cases where, you know, the, the EKG machine says normal and, um, you know, defendants are up on the on the stand and trying to explain themselves away when we truly do have to have an understanding of this stuff and we, we can't rely on the machine. Uh, the machine's not sitting there looking at the patient. You know, if the EKG, mach EKG machine says normal, but the patient's diaphoretic and they're talking about seeing a light that they're they're being pulled towards, then you really can't rely on what the EKG says. Uh, we have to use our own clinical judgment and uh, and 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 use our experience to help with that interpretation. And like what Jen said earlier, leaving the leaving the leads tied on to the patient and getting that serial EKG every five minutes to see if there are any dynamic changes that are taking place. Absolutely. Those are really, really good comments. All right. So uh, if there's no other questions, we are going to switch gears a little bit. And I do want to mention, uh, and Val, if you can, please put a, a, a link to the Facebook group. At EB Medicine, we've created a, an online community for urgent care clinicians, and we really want to build this out and invite people in uh, so that you've got a safe space to come in, ask questions. We put up a lot of free content every week, um, you know, uh, discussions on work notes. You know, how common is it that uh, that you're seeing patients come into urgent care for work notes and and things like that? And just kind of share with you what, uh, you know, what's going on around the country in the urgent care space. Uh, but please join uh, the urgent care group, uh, invite your colleagues, your coworkers to come in and join us, because uh, over time, we really do want to build that out uh, to where there's uh, some good discussion going on. Uh, you can bring in your own clinical cases, uh, not asking for real time advice, obviously, but just to share what you're seeing, what you're learning. Um, and, you know, again, come in, join us, invite your colleagues. And I think Val has put that in there. Yep. Awesome. Okay, so for the last few minutes, we want to talk a little bit about the uh, the new offering from uh, EB Medicine, which is called the Urgent Care EKG course. Uh, it was developed by Jen, our, our guest speaker today, and EB Medicine. And if you have any questions during this demo, please put those in the Q&A section, and we'll try to answer those as well. Um, and if you like what you're seeing with this, I mean, it's kind of like with the laceration course, it's impossible to teach you everything about lacerations in a 40 minute webinar. And it's the same thing with EKGs. I mean, you know, cardiology is, uh, you know, internal medicine residency, then a cardiology fellowship and subspecialization with uh, with fellowships after that for electrophysiology. So it's really impossible to teach everything about EKGs in a brief webinar. So the course that Jen has uh, helped EB Medicine put together is a really fantastic way to get more in-depth knowledge on EKG management. So I'm going to share my screen if I can here. Let's see here. We're let's see here. All right, Val, I may need your help with sharing the screen. Oh, here we go down at the bottom. All right, so I'm going to share. Let 
here. Okay, all right. So this is the urgent care EKG course. And if we're, we're just going to kind of scroll down and I'll give a brief introduction and then Jen's going to kind of go in and talk about one of the modules a little bit more. Uh, but each module, yeah, there, there's 10 of them. And in the first kind of setting the stage, some of the basics, uh, module two, EKG terminology, uh, three is cardiac anatomy, module four, talking about some basic arrhythmias, things that she touched on today, uh, different EKG findings, things that we all have to be familiar with. And then module five, EKG interpretation, going through the basics, um, you know, some of the, the, the basic physiology and how cardiac physiology translates over to this one dimensional piece of paper with all these lines and, 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 and tracings. Uh, module six, which I think is really probably the, the, the coolest part of this entire course and what she touched on a little bit today with the chief complaint-based approach, T-wave villains, things that you just absolutely have to be familiar with and have to identify, case studies. Uh, whenever you purchase this course, it does come with an EKG workbook that Jen walks you through. Uh, it comes with crayons and you're able to kind of go through and uh, she really does just an amazing job with uh, simplifying the uh, unsimplifiable uh, with this stuff and, and does a great job going through it. And then some tips specific to urgent care. So I'm going to click on this chief complaint based approach here. And Jen, you know, we can't go through the entire module here, but you know, what are some of the things that, you know, we, we talked about some of them, uh, but maybe dive in a little bit more to, um, you know, like with, with weakness, perhaps. Sure. Yeah. Weakness is something that I think is the bane of all providers existence and kind of working through the differentials with that. So we kind of walk through exactly what to ask the patient, exactly what to worry about. And we, we do veer off a little bit into the non-cardiac stuff as well, just to make sure you, you cast a wide net. But ultimately, we talk about some of the EKG findings you wouldn't want to miss, what labs to get. So we kind of give you, I don't know, sort of a recipe for the workup, which is what we do with each of these chief complaints. We touched on a little bit here, but for example, with you know, palpitations, we talk about, you know, how many PVCs are a problem? Um, what type of PVCs are a problem? What What's sometimes the next step? And how do I identify a PVC? What does it look like? And then, of course, um, under the dyspnea, we do go over the S1, Q3, T3 pattern, which is something we kind of touched on a little bit that would indicate that they have a PE. So we, we show you what that looks like as well. All right. Um, so, you know, again, just more about the, the chief complaint based approach. And I think Jen, you did a great job explaining that in the, in the lecture today. Um, let's see if there's anything else. How about just maybe one or two, we've got a few more minutes. So maybe, you know, with some of these T wave villains, what do you mean when you say T wave villains? Well, T waves, Patrick, I think, you know, are my favorite thing. Um, <laughs> so Sorry if I'm going to just gloat for a minute uh, about my love for two ways, but the reason why is because there's so many things that can actually be told through the T waves eyes. So, for example, electrolytes, we can find out if someone has hyperkalemia or hypokalemia just from the size of the T wave. We can find out if there's ischemia or blocked arteries from is the T wave biphasic? Is the T wave too big, for example? We can see um, literally if there's prolonged QT because the T wave is running away from the QRS. So the T wave is so helpful. And, and of course, ACS is, is huge too. We look at that for ACS, but there's just so many other things. And the one thing that I don't think anybody ever taught me in the beginning was that the T wave should be a little bit asymmetric. And really, really honing in on the symmetry of the T-wave. If you have symmetry, that's where the gold is. So if you spot something that's symmetric, you don't want symmetry. And you need to go look at that further and really deep dive into it because you could be dealing with ACS. But I also talk about the other things that that could mean as well. Okay. Uh, so there was one thing, and we've, we've got a few more minutes. I'm just going to put this Wellens warning because this was somewhat new to me when I went through this course and was really, really helpful. Maybe just a brief intro into to Wellens sign sure. and Wellens warning. We, so we saw an example of this now uh, with the biphasic T-wave 
earlier in a couple of our cases, especially the one that had Takotsubo's, she had a biphasic T wave as well. And biphasic T waves, if they're in the V2, V3 section, they get a name, which is called um, Wellen's warning. And the concern for these T waves is that the patient will need a um, an extent in their LED within a week of finding this pain-free or not because it's a high-grade LED occlusion. You know, it's funny, Patrick, because I've recently realized that if you could grade how whiny the arteries are on like a one to 10 scale, the LAD is the whiniest. Wellens warning, D winters, um, hyperacute T waves, like that's just three of the ways the LAD will complain to you. Or the RCA, the RCA is just like, yeah, elevation, right? Um, but the LAD has so many different ways it tries to tell you it's sick, which is good because it's the most important one. I mean, I think. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you for, for going into a little bit more detail. And I, I think that you can see, you know, just from looking at uh, the breadth of this course, this is a great thing for all of us who are working in the acute setting, whether in emergency medicine or in urgent care, uh, you know, a, a great resource for you to be able to dive in, take a deeper look. And then, of course, you know, bring those questions to any questions that you've got to the Facebook group that I mentioned earlier. Uh, because we do, we really want to help support you in your educational journey, not just sell you a course. We really want to be there for you and, and help you along the way. So I will switch over. There's one last thing to show you. Uh, this is a special promotion that we've got for the EKG course. Uh, if you use promo code WEBINAR3, uh, that will give you 20% off and you get a free EB Medicine t-shirt. Uh, again, just the, you know, a little bit more detail about the urgent care EKG course. Uh, there's a 10-step process that Jen has developed to help you consistently and accurately read EKGs. And I think that that's also an important factor with this, is to approach the EKG in a systematic way every time so that you don't overlook things. Uh, 17 case studies with the workbook, uh, the EKG worksheets that you can mark up and you can practice your interpretation. It does come with five AMA PRA category one credits um, that you can use for your, you know, for your CMA requirements. So use code webinar3 for 20% off. And that will wrap up. I will stop sharing there. So just kind of in closing and in summary, uh, we really hope that you enjoyed today. <clears throat> excuse me, today's event. We're offering everybody, like I've mentioned, 20% uh, off. If you use that code webinar3, you get the t-shirt and 20% off of the EKG course. It's limited time offer, so please act fast. Uh, but most importantly, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you, Jen, for being our expert and providing us with this terrific presentation. We really appreciate your time uh, for, you know, for you putting all this together and sharing your knowledge and insight with us. Uh, if you registered for this webinar, you're going to receive an email with a link, uh, with a recording uh, within the next week or so. But again, you can always come into the Facebook group and ask any questions reach out to us at EB Medicine uh, if you have any questions about subscribing. We do work with a lot of urgent care groups and would be happy to speak either with you or with your medical director, chief medical officer, uh, to talk about group uh, rates and group discounts for your urgent care team. Uh, but don't forget to take advantage of this 20% discount using code WEBINAR3. That wraps everything up. Uh, from the EB Medicine team. Uh, we appreciate you all being here and happy Thanksgiving. You can just <clears throat> close your browser window to, uh, to leave the chat. Thanks, everybody.